Okay. If we could turn, please, in our Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. And I'm going to read from chapter 6, uh, beginning in verse 4. And I will read all the way down to verse 14, the end of the chapter. And uh, we'll kind of remind ourselves of where we are in terms of our understanding of the book and uh, look into it. We're going to be thinking today, our title is going to be Preserving a Remnant. Preserving a Remnant. So beginning uh, in verse 4, it says this, and I'm reading from the King James uh, Bible here, it says, uh, And your altars shall be desolate, and your images shall be broken, and I will cast down your slain men before your idols. And I will lay the dead carcasses of the children of Israel before their idols, and I will scatter your bones round about your altars. In all your dwelling places, the city shall be laid waste, and the high places shall be desolate, that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate, and your idols may be broken and cease, and your images may be cut down, and your works may be abolished, and the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and ye shall know that I am the Lord." Yet will I leave a remnant that you may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations when ye shall be scattered through the countries. And they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations whither they shall be carried captives because I am broken with their whorish heart which hath departed from me and with their eyes which go a-whoring after their idols, and they shall load themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abominations. And they shall know that I am the Lord, and that I have not said in vain that I would do this evil unto them. Thus saith the Lord God, smite with thine hand and stamp with thy foot, and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. He that is far off shall die of the pestilence. He that is near shall fall by the sword. And he that remaineth and is besieged shall die by the famine. Thus will I accomplish my fury upon them. Then shall ye know that I am the Lord, when their slain men shall be among their idols, round about their altars, upon every high hill, and in all the tops of the mountains." And every, under every green tree and under every thick oak, the place where they did offer sweet savour to all their idols, so will I stretch out my hand upon them and make the land desolate, yea, more desolate than the wilderness toward Diblath and in all their habitations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, so as we uh, contemplate this uh, particular chapter, uh, just reminding ourselves that he began with these uh, action sermons. He was actually uh, struck mute by the Lord. He wasn't allowed to speak until the Lord opened his mouth. But he was given these various action sermons, which we saw in the first four chapters. And then basically from chapter five onwards, he has now been given his first message. This first message that began in chapter 5 goes all the way through chapter 6 and ends in chapter 7. So basically what he's done is he's first of all got the attention of the people of the captivity through his, his action sermons, and then he delivers this message to them. And so in chapter 6, the message primarily is concerning the, the desolation of the land of Israel. And we we kind of gave a brief outline that in verses 1 through 7, you have the destruction of the shrines. And he's particularly, uh, we thought about this last time, he's pulling down their high places that they had set up on every hill uh, to the, the various uh, deities of the Canaanites and all the rest of it. He is tearing down the high places. So that's uh, chapters 1 through uh, verses 1 through 7. Verses 8 through 10, we are going to learn, and particularly we're going to pay attention to this this today, is that despite the desolation of the land, God is still going to preserve a remnant. And of course, this we've said all along, this is so important. 
because the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob cannot be fulfilled if all of the Jews are wiped out. <laughs> even though they're worthy of it, even though their sin would justify it, God is going to preserve a remnant. Through this remnant, the Messiah is going to come. Through this remnant, God's promises to the patriarchs are going to find fulfillment. So this little section from verse 8 through 10 is very important about the fact that God is going to preserve a remnant. And then verse 11 through 14, we see the execution of divine wrath upon the idolatry in the land. And one of the, the things that we uh, will observe both in this chapter and uh, in chapter 7 is that the purpose of what God is doing is that they might know that he is the Lord. And it's like a refrain that runs through this this message, this um, first message, uh, but also through the entire book. And so you'll notice, for instance, verse 7, uh, the first section, the destruction of the shrines, uh, ends with, and the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. The preserving of the remnant in 8 through 10. Uh, again, what's the purpose of that? Verse 10, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And then, in verse 11 through 14, again, it, 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 the execution of divine wrath concludes with, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And by the way, there's another one tucked in there in verse 13. It says, uh, the, then shall ye know that I am the Lord. So very, very dominant idea. We'll comment more about that when we get to verse 7 in our study. I think last time we had got as far as verse 4. And so, uh, again, I'm going to read verse 4 again just to give us the context because he's dealing with the high places here. And so in verse 4, it says, Your altars shall be desolate, your images shall be broken. I will cast down your slain men before your idols. And then verse 5, I will lay the dead carcasses of the children of Israel before their idols. I will scatter your bones round about your altars. So that's where we've kind of reached this verse 5. So I want to think about this little phrase, scattering your bones. It's a phrase that's always connected in Scripture with judgment. And, and of course, it's, uh, it's, it's you know, usually uh, the, in the land of Israel, they would, they would bury their dead. And uh, there's reasons for that. Uh, oftentimes, uh, there's reasons in terms of protecting from pestilence and all the rest of it. Because the idea of dead bones and, and, and kind of rotting bodies is is that which brings brings with it disease and all the rest of it and yet what we're going to see here is that god is going to scatter their bones and we we see this uh, how it's used in judgment elsewhere i want you just to look at a couple of references psalm 53 and it's always interesting to see the repetition of phrases in scripture uh, scripture is so uh, consistent in the way it uses these kind of phrases uh, so psalm uh, 53 and verse 5 he says there were they in great fear where no fear was, for God hath scattered the bones of him that encampeth against thee. Thou hast put them to shame because God hath despised them. So again, there's this phrase, uh, scattering the bones to do with divine judgment, to do with God defeating uh, the the enemies. Um, we, we see it in Psalm 141. Again, this idea of scattering the bones. And verse 7, it says, Our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth, as when one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. And again, it's kind of a lamentation uh, about the bones being scattered. It's kind of a, considered to be a, a, a very negative thing. And of course, in the case here, this is not the, the enemies of, of Judah. This is Judah. Their bones are going to be scattered uh, their bones are going to be stacked up around their high places. Uh, that's the picture that is being brought here. They would be the ones of the Israelites who become engrossed with pagan practices. And so it was. this was literally fulfilled. Now, I'm going to do something I don't normally do. <laughs> so kind of uh, hold on to your hats here. This is kind of a very different thing. But I'm actually going to quote from the Apocrypha. <laughs> now, again, I do, I, let me just say this. I do not believe the Apocrypha is inspired. However, it is a collection of books that talk about Jewish history. And uh, particularly in the, the latter 
uh, stages of the captivity and also in the 400 silent years. So in one of those apocryphal books, Baruch, in chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, it describes exactly this taking place. It says, they, speaking of the Babylonians, they opened the sepulchres of the principal people and threw the bones about on every side. <laughs> and so the very thing that's been referred to here, at least in Jewish history, they have records of this actually taking place. The Babylonians literally opening the graves, scattering the bones. And so basically he says in verse six uh, or verse five, I will lay the dead carcasses of the children of Israel before their idols. I'll scatter your bones round about them. And so the thought here is this, that usually on their altars, their high places where they worship Baal and they worship the various Ashtaroth and the various Canaanite deities, uh, instead of the smell of incense being offered before their altars and shrines, there would be the smell of rotten, putrefying corpses. That's the picture that's being conveyed. Pretty dramatic, pretty graphic picture of what God was going to do in judgment because of their persistence in these uh, worshiping in these high places. And so then he goes on to verse 6. He says, In all your dwelling places, the cities shall be laid waste, the high places shall be desolate, that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate, your idols may be broken and cease, your images may be cut down, and your works may be abolished. And so, again, this is God's purpose. The land had been defiled by idols. The idols themselves would now be defiled by the corpses of the worshippers. It would be a retribution in kind. Uh, they had defiled the land. God is going to defile these places with these uh, worshippers' dead bodies. And it would be the height of desecration, replacing the fragrance of incense with the odor of putrefaction. Your idols may be broken and made to cease. And, of course, the promise was fulfilled. The devastating judgment of the Babylonian captivity actually cured Israel of their idolatry. When they came back after 70 years, the Israelites never again had an issue with idolatry. It was God had caused these idols to cease. You will not read post-captivity of any high places anywhere in the land of Israel. Uh, and so God is dealing with it. Uh, this devastating judgment did come. Uh, it did uh, indeed cure them of their idol problem. And so uh, we've mentioned before, I believe, but it, it is interesting that the words that he uses when he says, uh, make, he says, um, your altars may, be, and again, notice the emphasis on your altars. He's not acknowledged them as anything to do with him. Your altars and your idols may be broken and cease. Your images may be cut down. Your works may be abolished. And, and so the word that he uses when he says your idols is a very derogatory term. It is. It can be translated as blocks of wood, <laughs> which is what they were. Uh, they, you know, they chopped a tree down. They half of it they cooked their dinner. The other half of it they made a, a god out of, and they bowed down and worshipped. But it also, the very same phrase is used to refer to dung pellets dung pellets and so the high places had been removed uh, by godly kings in the past like hezekiah and josiah but the reformation revival under these kings was always short-lived and very soon the idols and shrines were back in place and the lord speaks very derogatory of them Judah worshipped these high places, as we've already mentioned, Moloch and Baal and Ashtaroth, all the gods of both the surrounding nations and the Canaanites that had preceded them. And, of course, uh, we've already said that along with this worship, there was uh, fertility rites and immorality of the vilest possible kind. And so verse 7 says, And the slain shall fall in the midst of you. And then we come to this little formula, And you shall know that I am the Lord. It's, it's, it's called a recognition formula. I like that. Uh, what is God's purposes in all of this? We've said that, that God is a God who wants to be known. 
Uh, he had been known by the land of Judah in times past, but they had committed spiritual adultery and they'd left him and they'd gone after their idols. And so God is bringing about calamity in the land for the express purpose that he might be known once again by his people. And so it occurs 60 times in the book of Ezekiel. And so we're going to be repeating this a lot. If we continue through the book, we're going to be seeing, you shall know that I am the Lord. It's 77 times in the King James Bible. First mention is in the book of Exodus, uh, chapter six and verse seven. Uh, and again, I just, I'm reading Exodus in my devotions right now. And this morning I was in chapter 16. And again, it says, they shall know that I am the Lord. So it's kind of, it's a refrain. And so the, 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 the plagues of Egypt, uh, what was the purpose? That they might know that I am the Lord. And so the thought is this, that um, God's motive in all that he does is that he might be recognized and known as the only true God. That's why he does what he does, that you might know that I am the Lord. He had told Israel plainly that they should worship no other gods in the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. They'd, they'd had it impressed on their minds from the very beginning. And uh, uh, the book uh, it, uh, tells us that uh, idolatry will not have the last word. And this is what's so encouraging, because remember we, when we this prophecy began in chapter 6, he says in verse 2, Son of man, set thy face toward the mountains of Israel. And so this message is against the, the mountains of Israel, because that's where the high places were set up. But what we're going to see is when we, we look at the book of Ezekiel, the idols will not have the last word. And God has another message for the mountains of Israel. And let's just kind of, we're going to skip ahead here and, and go to chapter 36, Ezekiel 36. And in verses 1 through 12, we have another message to the mountains of Israel. I just want you to notice verse 1. Also thou, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel, and say, ye mountains of his Israel, hear the word of the Lord. So now he's got a message again for the mountains of Israel. Just like he had in chapter 6, he has a message in chapter 36. Now we won't take the time of reading the whole uh, 12 verses, but let's break in in verse 8 through 11, and we'll see enough to know that idols are not going to have the last word on the mountains of Israel. And so he says this in verse chapter 36, verse 8, But ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. For behold, I am for you. Now, to now, who he's been telling them, I'm against you because of all their idolatry. Now God, he says, I'm for you. I will turn unto you and you shall be tilled and sown, and I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it, and the city shall be inhabited, and the waste shall be builded, and I will multiply on you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit, and I will set settle you after your former estates, your old estates, and will do better unto you than at your beginning." And ye shall know that I am the Lord. And so even though right now we're in a kind of a very kind of depressing section where God is denouncing uh, the mountains of Israel as being home of all these shrines and this idolatry, and yet there's hope in the book of Ezekiel that in the coming day, uh, this nation will return to their land. Uh, this land will be fr fruitful and prosperous again. They will know that he is the Lord. He's going to do better to the, for them than he did at the beginning. Uh, and so, so again, one of the great truths that I, I hope we all believe in is that God has a plan to restore his people, Israel. And that plan is to not only restore them to the land, but restore his relationship with them and make them that city on the hill that cannot be hid. Make them that light to the nations that God always intended them to be. And certainly that is what we're going to see in the last days. God is going to restore this people, and they are going to be, uh, they're going to be, people are going to grab hold of the skirt of the Jew, 
and say to him, tell me about your God. <laughs> we want to know about your God. And they're going to be a light to the whole earth. What, what a glorious future they have. But before that, there's a lot of chastening that needs to take place. And so your slain shall fall in the midst of you. Verse 7, you shall know that I am the Lord. Now notice verse 8. He says, now this is where we get into the next section, the preservation of a remnant. So he's just talking about dead bodies everywhere. He's talking about huge judgment coming upon the land. And uh, if we just stop there, it would look like a hopeless thing. Everybody's it seems like everybody's going to die. But he says, yet, verse 8, will I leave a remnant that ye may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations when you shall be scattered through the countries. So we're going to take a little uh, time here to think about uh, the doctrine of the remnant in Scripture. It underlines the mercy of God in spite of man's failure. God will never leave himself without a remnant. No matter how bad man is and how wayward man is, God always preserves for himself a remnant. And it's a, a remnant of mercy, mercy and grace extended to a godly nucleus in the nation. And they'll be the foundational in, in, in God's future dealings and blessing of Israel. Uh, they, they're going to have a, a glorious future. Now, I want to just look at some scriptures on the remnant uh, just to see that this is clearly taught in the word of God uh, in various places. So let's go back to the book of Isaiah and chapter 1. And verse 9. So we're going to look at a few references now, both Old and New Testament, to what we call the doctrine of the remnant. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9, it says, and of course this is quoted in the New Testament, and we're going to see this in Romans chapter 9. It says in, in um, Isaiah 1, verse 9, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. This is on very small remnant. He says, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. <laughs> and of course, we know that God wiped out the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain, uh, through fire and brimstone coming down. And God says that Israel was so wicked, <laughs> and it was only the fact of the mercy of God that he preserved a remnant so that they did not end up like Sodom and like Gomorrah. Book of Isaiah, chapter 10. Isaiah, chapter 10, and verse 20. We're just kind of tracing this through. It says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Wow, what a hopeful verse. Uh, uh, this remnant in a coming day are going to be stayed upon. We often sing, stayed upon Jehovah. Hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. Well, here's a nation that oh, in a coming day are going to be stayed upon Jehovah. They're going to be stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And it says, in truth, they're going to not be deceived and following error anymore they'll be stayed upon him in truth what a, what a glorious prospect now even in the babylonian captivity if you look at jeremiah 43 you read about the fact that after the siege and after the taking the um, them into captivity god had preserved a little remnant it says in verse 5 but Jehon Je jehonan the son of Kerea, and all the captives of the forces took all the remnant of Judah that were returned from all nations, whither they had been driven to dwell in the land of Judah. So there we have a, a remnant after the Babylonian captivity mentioned here, or, or after the desolation of Jerusalem. A few more. Now we're going to go to the minor prophets and the book of Zephaniah, one we don't hear much about. Uh, but Zephaniah, uh, a couple of verses in chapter 2, and then in chapter 3, chapter 2, verse 7. It says, And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon. In the houses of Ashkelon shall they lie down, 
in the evening, and the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. Again, a promise of a remnant. Chapter 3 of Zechariah, verse 13. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their midst, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Wow, what a what a beautiful scripture that is. There's a coming day. Now it's not today. Yeah, there's there's the people in Israel today. Um, I suspect many of them go to sleep at night afraid. And the reason is because rockets are coming in from Lebanon every single day. Often we, we'll check on the uh, uh, various sites and during the night you could have 200 rockets have gone into the, the land of Israel in one night. They're not laying down and being unafraid. <laughs> there's fear, uh, but there's a coming day when they will lay down in the land. They'll be unafraid. Uh, what a day that's going to be, the day of the glorious remnant. Look at uh, Zechariah as we continue to see this remnant doctrine taught through Scripture concerning the nation of Israel. Chapter 10, verse 9, he says, And I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their children and turn again. And I'll bring them again also out of the land of Egypt, gather them. So God bringing back this remnant. Uh, New Testament, of course, we know Romans 9, Romans 11. Uh, those are the key passages that talk about as God cast away his people. Is it all over for Israel that he foreknew? Has he done with them forever? And some people believe that. Some people believe that the church has replaced Israel in the purposes of God, and God has no future purpose for Israel. But again, the book of Romans tells us God has a purpose. He hasn't abandoned his people. And so he says in verse 6, Not as though the word of God have taken none effect, for they're not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they're the seed of Abraham. Are they all children? But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And he goes on and talks about this, this idea of a remnant. And he says um, uh, that there is this remnant according to the election of grace. Look at chapter 11 and verse 5. He says, Even so then at the present time, also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And so we know that God will preserve for him a remnant. So as we look at uh, our section now, back in chapter 6, bear in mind this doctrine of the remnant. We're going to learn three things in chapters 8, uh, through uh, verses 8 through 10. First of all, we're going to see the scattering of the remnant, and then the sorrow of of the remnant for their sin in verse 9, which is a, a beautiful uh, truth, and then the strength of God's word towards the remnant in verse 10. So those three things. Scattering of the remnant. He says, Yet will I leave a remnant that you may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations when you shall be scattered through the countries. So even though God's going to preserve a remnant, and they're going to still be scattered through the countries. And so he says, um, the remnant, uh, of course, he had illustrated that. Remember in one of his messages when he had that strange haircut and he shaved his hair with a sword and, and a third of it, you know, kind of was burned. A third of it was cut with a sword and various things. And another third of it was destroyed. And then, uh, so with the 1%, you know, Third, third, third is 99%. 1% was kept in his skirt. That's kind of the remnant that he's speaking about in Ezekiel 5, verse 3 and 4. Here God specifically promised to leave a remnant that would be the basis of later restoration. And the, these remnant would be scattered among the nations and through the countries, verse 8. And so scattered through the countries uh, among the nations. That's the language. So they're going to be scattered. Again, we, we had this predicted. The Lord told them if they did not keep his covenant uh, that he had given to them. Uh, Leviticus 26, this is exactly what God said would happen. God is acting according to his word and according to his character. He says, let me just read uh, for a moment from Leviticus 26, verse 40. Uh, down to verse 46, it says, If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I have also walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, 
and in then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham. And I'll remember and I will remember the land. The land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbaths while she lieth desolate without them. And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity because even because they despise my judgments because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the statutes, the judgments, the laws, which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the land of Moses. Uh, hand of Moses. So basically, again, just this idea, they break the covenant, he's going to scatter them amongst their enemies. But if amongst their enemies, they remember him, and they come in repentance, he'll remember his promises, and he'll bring them back. He's So again, God is just being uh, consistent. One thing we know is um, the Lord will not make a full end of his people. And we have a couple of clear references to that. I'm speaking of the nation of Israel. Uh, a lot of them will die uh, in the tribulation period. We know for sure two-thirds of the Jews in existence at the time of the tribulation period will perish in the tribulation, two-thirds. But God will never make a full end of his people. There'll always be this remnant. So Jeremiah 30 and verse 11 he says, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I'll correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Another reference to this again in Jeremiah 46 and verse 28. Jeremiah 46, verse 28. It says, for fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure, yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. So we get that repetition here. So God, God's people um, are, uh, his ancient people, Israel, they are going to suffer greatly, but God will never forget them. And he'll, and he'll not make a full end of them. And there is a remnant, and that remnant will one day be restored, even though they're scattered amongst the nations. Now, we have one more reference uh, about this uh, to look at before we move on to the sorrow of the remnant, and that's in the book of Amos. And again, in the Minor Prophets. Amos chapter 9 and verse 15, we read this. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord God. So not only is there a coming day when the remnant will be restored, they'll be restored to God, they'll be restored to the land. But he promises them in that day, they'll never ever be plucked up out of the land again. <laughs> of course, we're looking at the millennial reign of Christ when they're in the land and they will be there and prosper in the land, knowing their God after they've looked on him whom they've pierced, they mourn for him. Then they'll enter into their time of Israel's glory, as it were, and he'll never pluck them out of the land again. So verse nine, the sorrow of the remnant for their sins. Back in Ezekiel, again, chapter six, verse nine, it says, and they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whither they shall be carried captives, because I am broken with their whorish heart, which hath departed from me, and with their eyes, which go whoring after their idols, and they shall load themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abomination. So God promised that one day, some of those who had been exiled out of the land of Israel, he says, they'll remember me. They'll remember the covenant. 
of God. They'll call upon his name. They're going to remember me. And uh, he uses a, a kind of human language here, but it gives us a little window into the heart of God here. He says, they, they escape, you shall remember me among the nations, whither they shall be carried captives. And notice what he says, because I am broken with their whorish heart. <laughs> that amazing? Um, so what he's saying is, God is expressing the depth of the grief he felt over his adulterous people. He said, I'm broken. <laughs> There's a, uh, a song, actually, I listened to it this morning. It's uh, M Michael Card. I don't know if any of you know Michael Card. He was very popular back in the, the 90s. But uh, his songs make me always think of scripture. And one of them is titled, To a Broken God. And uh, it really is quite remarkable, isn't it? That God, it, it, here's this, this all-powerful, almighty God, and yet his own people have the capacity, as it were, to break his heart by their waywardness. <laughs> and that would include us. I, I really believe it's possible we could grieve the heart of God by our wayward conduct. And so here's a people that are uh, just uh, have broken the heart of God with their whorish heart. They're, 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 they're like prostitutes. They're, they'll, they'll give themselves to the highest bidder, uh, whoever that might be. I mean, that's the idea. And so uh, just a terrible thought that uh, they would be like that. And so the strongest figure possible is used to portray the divine suffering God is represented as broken. The amazing truth is most vividly brought out in the prophecy of Hosea. And uh, we don't have time to, to spend a lot of time there, but uh, Hosea is a man who is brought to an understanding of the suffering of God by his own domestic tragedy. He's to marry a woman who is unfaithful. And so he experiences you know, he provides for this woman. He cares for this woman. He loves this woman. And she's always running after other lovers. And Hosea portrays for us this idea of how much God's heart is broken by the waywardness of his people. And, of course, uh, spiritual adultery is the language here that, that is kind of being conveyed to us, whoring after their idols. He says them. Um, uh, which have departed from me with their eyes, which go a whoring after their idols. Instead of their eyes looking to him and looking at his glory, uh, they're they're looking out for idols and they're they're chasing after them. They've committed all their evils, their abominations. And so again, we just want to trace this this idea of spiritual adultery a little bit. Just won't take a minute, but it's good to look at the various references. Isaiah fifty four verse five. We read this language it says for thy maker is thine husband the lord of hosts is his name and thy redeemer the holy one of israel the god of the whole earth shall he be called so god says your maker is your husband and yet here they are they, they're going after strange gods they're being idolatrous towards him the book of jeremiah and chapter three jeremiah chapter three and again, we get this same language of the, uh, the adulterous nature of the people. It says, it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. <laughs> In other words, uh, the, the adultery was with these idols made out of stones, made out of stocks. Verse 14 of the same chapter. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married to you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And so again, turn, O backsliding children, for I am married to you. Jeremiah 31, where we're a uh, chapter that's predicting the new covenant, um, but he, in Jeremiah 31 and verse 32, he mentions the old covenant and he, he says, <clears throat> 31, 32, he states this. <clears throat> he says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, 
saith the Lord. Now, Ezekiel himself will deal with this in a much greater detail in chapter 16. And he's going to talk about the, the, the unfaithfulness and the harlotry of the nation of Israel in very graphic terms. But in case you think, well, this is just Israel, this is just the Old Testament, this has got nothing to do with us as New Testament believers, well, James would tell us differently. And he says in James 4, verse 4, speaking to New Testament saints, in this New Testament age, he says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And so for us, it's not that we're going after idols made of stone and wood, but the world sometimes so captivates our hearts that we lose our love and affection for the one who has bought us at such a great price. And so it's possible for us to be spiritually adulterous. And so very, very uh, sobering thing. Our sin can give God the heartbreak uh, that he's describing here, brokenness, because he loves us so. Indeed, on the cross, the Lord died of a broken heart, didn't he? That's what they say with the stream of blood and water. Uh, he was broken uh, because of the waywardness of God's people. Uh, and so, again, we just need to be so careful about these things. Again, we said that this word for idols that they were going after, he says, uh, whoring after their idols. Uh, again, this is that word that we've talked about, used uh, nine times in the rest of the Old uh, Testament. Um, 38 times in Ezekiel. <laughs> so he, he uses this term for idol all the time. And uh, again, we, we said it's a, it's translated sometimes detestable thing. It's a, uh, off, often means a pellet of dung. And so again, they're exchanging the glory of God and going after something that Ezekiel says is like a, a, a pellet of dung. And like, what what were they thinking? Uh, to exchange the glory of God for this. But in the, their captivity, when they really come to their senses, uh, we're going to see that um, there, there's going to be a brokenness on their part. And so he says, um, you'll remember me among the nations whether they be carried captives. And we just get a glimpse of it in Ezekiel. Uh, let's just look at a couple of verses. 20, Ezekiel 20, verse 43 we get a little bit of glimpse of their future brokenness. And there shall you remember your ways and all your doings. This is chapter 20 of Ezekiel, verse 43, wherein you have been defiled, and you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that you have committed. Ezekiel 36. Already been there once before talking about the mountains of Israel, getting a better message. But he says in verse 31, he says, Ezekiel 36, 31, he says, then shall you remember me, sorry, then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. So there's coming a day when they realize how serious their sin has been. And of course, I, I believe we've already talked about this, but in Zechariah, when it says they'll look upon him whom they've pierced. It says after that, it says, then they're going to mourn for him, like one who mourns for his firstborn son. And there will be absolute national brokenness. It seems like every family will be affected. And they'll realize the horror of their crimes in turning against this God who has done so much for them in redeeming them. And of course, their brokenness will bring about their restoration. They will bleed inwardly, blush outwardly, deeply detesting their former abominations and not waiting till uh, others condemn them. They shall condemn themselves. They're going to judge themselves. They're going to say, we have done terrible things. 
And so we can see a progression here. It's very, very actually very helpful about how do, how does somebody who's gotten away from God, what is the pathway back? <laughs> how do they get restored? Well, there's three very interesting things. First of all, there's remembrance of God. First thing is, they will remember me. It says, they that escape of you shall remember me. <laughs> Prodigal son, what? Well, what was the beginning of his repentance? Here he is eating the pig food, and he remembers the father's house. <laughs> Things were better there. Uh, he couldn't wait to get away from it, but now he's eating pig food. Suddenly he's called to remember the father's house. They will remember me, he says. That's the first. Remembrance of God is the first step towards genuinely repentance, calling him to remembrance. And then secondly, repentance from sin. Uh, they will, again, they'll load themselves. They'll see how deeply they have hurt and offended and broken the heart of God. And then once you've come through this remembrance of God, repentance from sin, the third aspect is relationship is restored to God. And so thankful that, again, God is so willing to receive the prodigal home. He stood on the porch watching, <laughs> waiting. Uh, he's desirous of that restored relationship. So verse 10 now looks at the strength of God's word towards this remnant. And so it says, and they shall and know that I am the Lord and that I have not said in vain that I would do this evil unto them. After their repentance, they would be restored to a relationship with uh, the Lord again. And the calamity God brought upon them, as severe as it was, would fulfill its corrective purpose on the people. They will acknowledge that he is Lord and that he has brought this punishment upon them. They'll just acknowledge this. And so we say that God's word always accomplishes its purposes. You know, we often quote Isaiah 55 and verse 11, and, and it's a, a worthy scripture to quote because, again, it tells us God's word, it always does Find its fulfillment. Isaiah 55 and verse 11, it says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing wherein I send it. And so they're acknowledging here in chapter 6, they shall know that I am the Lord and that I have not said in vain what I would do to this e this evil, this calamity unto them. And so they, they recognize that God's word accomplished its purpose. They will recognize that. And again, isn't it going to be wonderful when we see the end of the age and we'll be able to see that God's word, everything he said he was going to do, he'll restore his people. They'll be back in a relationship with him. They'll be back in the land. All of these things will be completely fulfilled. And we'll be able to look back and say, God's word did not return void. He accomplished everything that he set out to do. And that should give us great, great confidence. Now we move to our final section, verse 11 through 14, the execution of divine wrath. And so it says, Thus saith the Lord God, smite with thine hand, stamp with thy foot, and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. So God told Ezekiel to say the following words with these strong gestures. He's getting back into acting mode again. Remember, we said this is a prophet that's, that's often doing actions. And so now he's got to do some actions. And so as he says these words uh, that God commands him to speak, he says you to smite with your hand, stamp with your foot, and say, Alas, for all the evil abomination of the house of Israel, they'll fall by the sword, the famine, the pestilence. So again, another piece of drama. And um, certainly we could say this, if you want to, uh, uh, the most, probably one of the most dramatic prophets in the Bible, you can't go further than Ezekiel. He, he, he knows drama. I mean, he's a, he, and he's using very dramatic things to get their attention. So yet another piece of drama. And um, he wants to arrest the attention of Israel because they they had up to this point regarded their idolatry as a light thing. But God saw it as an evil abomination. So the idea of clapping, stamping, clapping the hand, stamping his foot, 
Interesting that it's used in other occasions in Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel 21. Ezekiel 21, verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and smite thine hands together. And let the sword be doubled the third time, the sword of the slain. It is the sword of the great men that are slain, which entereth into the privy chambers. So again, he's told, once again, smite your hands together. In that verse, verse 17, I will also smite my hands together and I will cause my fury to rest. I, the Lord, have said it. And so clearly the idea of clapping the hand, stamping the foot, there's a message behind it. And it, it's it it's really kind of a picturing God's future invasion by the Babylonians. Uh, so um, the stamping of the foot symbolizes the marching of the soldiers that will be coming into the land, uh, the clapping of the hands, the, the clashing of the swords as God's wrath is accomplished against a disobedient people. Now, again, we, we notice it, it certainly is a, an expression of anger and disappointment as well. If you go back to the book of Numbers, chapter 24, it's a story of Balak and Balaam. And you'll notice in chapter 24 of Numbers in verse 10, it says, Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I call thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. So it's kind of a picture of disgust. I called you to do this, and you haven't done it. And so there's a sense of God's disgust of their idolatry, their unbrokenness, a picture of the judgment that's going to come. Uh, by the Babylonians, uh, their marching armies, their clashing of their swords. And so, and of course, we want to say this, and we, we've said it as we've gone through Ezekiel, but God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Uh, God has, been, has shown such long suffering to this people, but there comes a point where his chastening hand has to fall even though he takes no pleasure in it. And so three weapons are going to be used in this uh, smiting uh, that God will bring. And so he mentions um, that uh, they're going to fall uh, by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. The sword of the Babylonians, the famine in the city, the pestilence which inevitably follows famine. He says, he that is far off shall die of the pestilence. He that is near shall fall by the sword. He that remaineth is besieged shall die by the famine. Thus will I accomplish my fury upon them. So no escape apart from the remnant. Those are far off. Pestilence will catch to them. The near fall by the sword. Those that remain in the city, the famine will get them. God will accomplish his divine fury on the nation. And again, what's the purpose? Then shall ye know that I am the Lord. When their slain men shall be among their idols round about their altars upon every high hill in all tops of the mountains upon every green tree and under every thick oak the place where they did offer sweet savor to all their idols again kind of a bit of a repetition of what we saw earlier in the chapter instead of incense sweet savor coming up from these not to god but they were offering sweet savor offerings to their idols instead their corpses, their carcasses would be stacked like cords of wood around their idols and their high places. Instead of a sweet savor, there will be a foul stench of death everywhere. So he says in verse 14, so will I stretch out my hand upon them and make the land desolate, yea, and more desolate than the wilderness toward Diblath, in all their habitations, they shall know that I am the Lord. So again, the the purpose of it all, Ezekiel's message, Ezekiel's longing, is that Jehovah, the Lord, might be known by all men, Israelite and non-Israelite alone, that people might come to know that he is God. That's the purpose of God's dealings in history, that men might know him. He, he's a God that wants to be known. He's a God that has, uh, has revealed himself to men. He's a God that wants relationship with man. And uh, so he talks about this place called Diblath. Now, this is a very challenging, difficult verse um, because nobody actually knows where Diblath is. Now, it's certain that 
those Ezekiel wrote to knew exactly where Tiblath was. <laughs> but we don't know. And some have even gone so far as to change the name to Riblath because that's a place that is known. So the NIV does that. And um, although there's no justification in the text whatsoever to make that change, but they've done it because they couldn't identify a place. Well, it doesn't really matter. The people that he was writing to knew what he was talking about. And the thought is this, um, that more desolate than the wilderness towards Diblath, that the land of Judah is going to become more desolate than this particular location that the people were well aware of. They knew about this wilderness towards Diblath, and he is telling them that the very land, you remember that land that was flowing with milk and honey? That land that was lush and uh, rich, uh, uh, grapes that it took two men to carry, this land that God had promised them, this very land is going to be like this wilderness of Diblath. And why? Because of the consequence of their persistent idolatry and sin. This is, uh, sin is withering. It's a withering, withering thing. And it takes away fruitfulness and always leads to barrenness. And so here we see the very land that was meant to be flowing with milk and honey is going to be like a wilderness at Diblath. May the Lord challenge us about living a life that is fruitful for God, which means loyalty to God, devotion to God, intimacy with the Lord, not waywardness and spiritual adultery in our hearts. May God help us in these things. Amen.